Okay. <clears throat> hmm. Not sure how this is going to go. <laughs> I thought I knew how the rest of the morning was going to go, and none of that's worked out. So um, maybe there's a lesson in that, you know. But, uh... Okay. Don't you just hate cheaters? You know, that guy that, like, um, the, Josh will identify with this because he's a police officer. You're at the light, and the right-hand lane says, no turn on red. And he pulls up and looks, and he turns, or she, and they turn anyway. She just hate that. You're not that, you're not that, nobody in here is that person. Or, or the person that pulls up, I encountered this guy at Lowe's last week, pulls up in front of Lowe's. You know how big the walk area is in front of Lowe's? Pulls his car right in front of the door. Not even back a ways, but right in front of the door, stops the car, gets out of the car, and goes into Lowe's. It's like, you know, what kingdom are you ruler of? And it, it took every bit of restraint for me to not follow him all the way through the store. He wasn't just going in for a minute. He was going in to shop. But there's that sp that's cheating, isn't it? Okay. Did you catch this a few years ago? Uh, Robert Madrazo, um, he was running for president uh, in Mexico. And he entered in the uh, Berlin Marathon. And in the over 55 category, and he ran a time of two hours, 41 minutes, and 12 seconds. I admire that. I admire anybody that will train and do that. The, the problem was, you know, as he crossed the line, here he is crossing the line, he's pumping his fist, and, and the officials began to notice that, you know, he's got a lot of clothes on. He's not even sweating, this guy. And so they began, they, they put little trackers on him, and they began to check his time and everything. And what they, they realized is that over a nine-mile nine uh, stretch, he covered that nine miles in 21 minutes. And that's pretty fast. Matter of fact, that's uh, twice as fast as the world record. So as a cheater, he's not even a very skilled cheater, you know. And uh, obviously took some shortcuts to appear at the finish line like, you know, uh, the people in Mexico, they, they said, well, he cheats at everything else. Why wouldn't he cheat at that? Mm -hmm. Hate cheaters, don't you? Even, even worse is people that do stuff like that. Uh, you know, a politician or, you know, it's being cheated by somebody that we, we trust, somebody that we love. I mean, th this is on a different level. When someone that we trust, that we love, lies to us or cheats us, we're hurt, and then most of the time we get angry. found this picture of a car. I hope we've got it. Yeah. Dear Dave, tell your girlfriend, your wife and kids, say hi. P.S. I cleaned out the bank. You're broke. Love, Nikki and the kids. <laughs> right? Or how about this one? How would you like to come home? Welcome home, cheater. Just drive on by, guys, because there's nothing there left for you anymore, right? But that's the way we are. When people that we love lie to us and cheat on us, man, it, it really hurts. I, I found a survey. Here's the first question. Men who hold this occupation are most likely to cheat, according to a 2012 online survey. A, lawyers, B, teachers, C, IT, engineers, D, doctors. What do you say? All of them. <laughs> wow. Okay. I didn't foresee that one. That was an obvious answer, isn't it? Of these guys. Okay. IT engineer was the winner here as the most likely to cheat. Um, this came from Ashley Madison, which uh, I shouldn't give out this website, but Ashley Madison is a website for people who are married that want to have an affair with someone else. And so you go there to cruise around and find other people. And so they took this survey of, you know, uh, 11,453 fathers with accounts on that site, and IT engineering field was the largest uh, field there. So, you know, yay for doctors and lawyers and and teachers because they're not as bad as IT engineering. Okay, number two. According to recent studies, uh, what percentage of women had affairs? Guys, we get our time too, right? 
So it's got to be 30 to 35 percent, right? No. 15 to 20? 15 to 10? 2 to 5 percent is the obvious answer, right? Wouldn't we say that? No. Answer is 15 to 20 percent. Hmm. 15 to 20 percent of women have had affairs according to studies from Indiana University. Can we trust that? Can we trust it? Yeah, we can trust. We can trust that. Uh, sorry, sorry. And Manchester Metropolitan University, I don't even know if that's a real university, but while a comparative 20 to 25 percent of men have cheated, they had to throw that in there. You know, that more men cheat than women. Okay, Let, that, that wasn't that funny. Let's move on to the next one. Number three, according to an online survey, mothers who cheat have been married for an average of this many years. One year, five years or less, 16 years or more, or 25 years. Answer, five years or less. Again, from this reputable website, this Ashley Madison website. Uh, they, they surveyed 2,865 of their married female members and found the typical cheating married woman was married for five years or less in her 30s and had a daughter under three years old. That's kind of shocking, really, isn't it? Last one. I know I'm bumming you out here. We're, we're going negative. Last one here. Number four, infidelity-based matchmaking site Ashley Madison has recently seen an influx of married women signing up for its services on the day after this holiday. Valentine's Day, New Year's, Mother's Day, Christmas. Mother's Day. Mother's Day, as a matter of fact, tops all other days in this. And, of course, you could do some analytical stuff and go, oh, the letdown of not being recognized on Mother's Day. So, so guys, 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 <laughs> it's up to you to keep your mother from cheating. So, so make sure on Mother's Day you just love all over her and make her really feel like her life is worthwhile because she'll end up on Ashley Madison. Probably not. You know, when a spouse or a, a boyfriend or girlfriend cheats on you, it's heart-wrenching. You, know, you feel betrayed, you feel used, uh, probably worthless, uh, you want revenge. At the same time, I mean, you just want to crawl under a rock and die. It's devastating. What's this got to do with Christmas? Well, here's the tie-in. Okay, we're talking about Joseph today. And uh, these feelings are probably what Joseph had. Um, in the situation we find in, in uh, the story that he's in because his fiance Mary, definitely looked like a cheater for a while. Uh, Joseph chose to break the rules, uh, the, the law, and follow God and what God told him to do. And he you know, would not divorce his suddenly pregnant bride-to-be. And I think in doing, he kind of gives us an indication of, of how Jesus breaks the rules sometimes for us and how he goes beyond uh, what some of the rules say to love us the way that we are. Now, as we look at this story before we read the scripture, you need to understand, I think most of you probably know this, but the laws of Joseph and Mary's day said that in that day, a betrothed or a, we would call it engaged person, um, could divorce. A betrothal was a legal thing. Engagement was a legal thing in their day. And they could divorce uh, their, their mate if she committed adultery. In fact, um, not only could a husband divorce the, the wife, the betrothed wife, but the law said that he was to divorce this betrothed wife because wife, she was unfaithful. And when he did that, there was some financial gain there because he would get back the dowry that he had paid for this like they did in those days. So the contract had been broken, she had been unfaithful, so he would get back his money that he had paid to her father. So the fact that Joseph decided to divorce Mary quietly, um, we find in this passage, indicates that he was willing to break the rules of law by not divorcing her publicly and to give up the financial gain that he was due. Uh, but God had uh, something much more, as we'll read here. Matthew 1, 18 to 25. This is how the birth of Jesus Christ took place. When Mary, his mother, was engaged to Joseph, before they were married, she became pregnant by the Holy Spirit. Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man. Because he didn't want to humiliate her, he decided to call off their engagement quietly. 
As he was thinking about this, an angel from the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife, because the child she carries was conceived by the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you will call him Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Now this took place so that what the Lord had spoken through the prophet would be fulfilled. Look, a virgin will become pregnant and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel. Emmanuel means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did just as an angel from God commanded and took Mary as his wife. But he didn't have sexual relations with her until she gave birth to a son, and Joseph called him Jesus. Now, when people saw Mary is pregnant, they would have two options here to think. One was that she and Joseph had been together, right? And that they had, you know, pushed things, so to speak, which just wasn't done in their day at all. The second one was that Mary had been with another man and had been unfaithful to Joseph. But no matter what, um, either way, the scandal would have made her unacceptable in society. Joseph knew that he wasn't the father, so he was left to believe the second option, that Mary had cheated on him. And even after the angel comes to him and tells the story, think about it. Your wife is pregnant by the Holy Spirit. Wow. So while Mary's parents sent her away to go visit the aunt down in Jerusalem, possible to probably avoid as much scandal as they could, Joseph decided to take things, care of things quietly. And we see, I think, in this, the, just the kind of man that Joseph was. I mean, this, is, this guy is really unbelievable. I don't think Joseph gets enough type. I don't think he gets enough credit, you know, for who he was. Because he really puts it out there. He's hurt. He didn't want to lash out in revenge on Mary. That'd be the natural thing to do. It'd be to lash out in revenge on her and to save his own reputation. And he he didn't want to shame her publicly. He said he just wanted to turn this this page and let her go on, and he would go on, and you know as little scandal as possible and as little harm for Mary. But while he's trying to find his way out, you know God steps in and God tells Joseph the rest of the story the whole story, what his plan is. And as a result, instead of following the law by divorcing Mary, Joseph, uh, I would call it, demonstrated a, a scandalous love. You know, he, what, what he does is really scandalous in his day. And he enters into that, you know. He's kind of like Jesus. I, I can see Jesus and Joseph, the way that Jesus did things. And the way that Jesus would not, you know, take the easy way, he, he, would not, he would always look out for the person. I mean, Joseph, he has this, this cheater, this rumored cheater of Mary, and, and Joseph has this same scandalous love for her that uh, Joseph does, that, that Jesus does for us. Remember, um, in, in his ministry, um, it was forbidden to touch a leper. Jesus touches the leper and heals the leper. For the Jews, they, they weren't supposed to go through Samaria. Samaria is a place where dirty people live. Half-breeds live in Samaria. Jesus constantly goes through Samaria. So remember the story of him at the woman at the well. Sits down with her. You know, a woman who's not exactly a virtuous person. And he gets a drink of water from her. He shows her honor, shows her respect. Went to dinner parties with people that, well, you just... You know, you're forbidden. You might get the cooties if you hang around these people too much. They're thieves. They're prostitutes. Kind of mob figures. Matter of fact, he even chooses one of these guys, Matthew, to be his disciple. Matthew writes the story for us. He's a tax collector. Forbidden to, to associate with them. They're traitors is who they are. Not for Jesus. See? Jesus, Jesus has his scandalous love for people. He, he's challenged all the time because he wouldn't follow some of their, their petty rules about, you know, hand washing and other petty things that, that they, these rules that they made up that made them feel important, made them feel and look like they were closer to God than these other people. Can you see Joseph in that? I can. I can see Joseph just kind of like, 
you know, his stepfather, jo- Joseph, like his stepson, excuse me, Jesus later on. Joseph broke the rules of law by marrying uh, Mary, and Jesus continued to break the rules of law all his life because someone greater, something greater was happening than all of these small little rules. And, you know, sometimes the laws don't make sense, especially since when God is doing something greater. Um, you might have missed this story, story of Bobby Martin. Bobby is a young boy in high school. As a senior, Bobby is extremely popular. Um, he was on special teams. He was a nose guard, a football player. Uh, up in uh, Dayton, around Dayton, Ohio, was where he went to school. And people who were close to Bobby, I mean, he was a leader. Uh, when he wrestled, um, he, he earned second place in the city, uh, second place in state championships. He ran for homecoming king. And the guy that was running with him, uh, uh, opposing him, apologized that he was running against Bobby because Bobby was much better than what he was. I mean, this is the kind of leader this guy was. Everybody loved him. And he just went at life full force. And he said, people care what I'm doing. I want to inspire them. I want to inspire them to get out and do something. But if you take a closer look at Bobby, you see that Bobby kind of expands our understanding of a typical all-American kid. Bobby is just three foot one, just weighs 111 pounds because he's born without legs. And yet he never thought of himself as handicapped. He says, I don't have any disability. I can do anything that everyone else does. On the football field, he wore these gloves and, and would propel himself. He's a, he's a great nose tackle. The other teams respected him a lot. Other coaches said, you better tackle him because he is going to tackle you. You need to look past the fact that he has no legs because he plays like any other player. But even with all those incredible accomplishments, Bobby ran into some opposition. And he managed to land himself in the center of a scandal. Uh, in a September game in 2005 at halftime, the referee announced that Bobby was ineligible to play the second half. And the reason he was ineligible to play was the rule book stated that a player could not compete without shoes, thigh pads, or knee pads. And since Bobby had no legs, he could not compete because he didn't have shoes, thigh pads, or knee pads. He tried a few plays with some shoes hung around his neck. <laughs> Didn't work so well. He ended up standing over on the sideline in tears. He said, this is the only time in my life that I felt handicapped or disadvantaged because someone said I couldn't do what I could do. He had to sit out. So how can we bench someone for not wearing shoes when he doesn't have any legs? Just to have rights doesn't mean that we're right, does it? I mean, sometimes breaking the rules of law makes sense because someone's rights are not the same as what's really right. Having the right to say something doesn't mean that saying it is right. We have the right to use our mouths to say all kinds of nasty things, but that doesn't mean that that's the right thing to do. Freedom of speech doesn't mean it's right to lie about somebody or, or to speak hatefully. Having the right doesn't make it right. Joseph had a lot of rights. He had the right to divorce Mary. He had the right to do it with great fanfare so he could protect his own honor, so he could get back the, the money that he had, had given. But Joseph sensed that it wasn't right to do this. He was, as it says, he was a righteous man. And so he was just going to divorce her privately. And then God stepped in and he sends an angel, a messenger, to speak his word to Joseph of how Mary's pregnancy from God was a part of the plan. And Joseph's response was to do what the angel of the Lord had commanded him. Instead of asserting his rights, instead of standing up for himself, he listens to God and does what God's plan is. And God breaks the, the rules of law in this story we find that Christmas reminds us, us of what's really right sometimes. We're not people who are focused on what we can do. We are people who are focused on what we should do. What if, what if Joseph had said, you know, i got to follow my heart. 
I got I got to do what I need to do. I I got to look out for myself. I I've had dreams of my life, and I've had dreams of a family, and I've had dreams for Mary and I, and she has. She has ruined all those dreams, and, and no one can tell me what's right for me. This is my life, and I have the right to divorce her if I want to, and you're judging me if you say that I'm wrong. I mean, isn't that how the world comes at this a lot of times? To say, I have my rights? I have to look out for myself? I mean, what if, what if we just did everything by our feelings? You know, feel, feelings can be very misleading sometimes. To just do things that we feel are right. What if Joseph had not listened to God and decided that he would do what he wanted to do? I, I, I can't, you know, we, we don't know what's going to happen. I, I personally think somebody else would have been there. You know, God has a plan for salvation. That plan is going to happen with or without Joseph. But Joseph just would have not had the privilege of being who God had destined him to be. By marrying her, uh, Joseph became part of a scandal. Saved her from scorn, saved her from financial hardship, even though it meant that he too had to take on the consequences of what was a supposed sin. And I think there's this incredible foreshadowing of how Jesus enters into our sin in the same way that, that Joseph enters into the sin of Mary, see, supposed sin of Mary. Uh, Jesus takes the consequences that should be ours, and he, he offers us forgiveness and salvation and gives us his grace. Joseph could have gotten out of the scandal. Instead, he chose to do what was right and to enter into the scandal. Of course, Mary had not sinned, uh, but it certainly looked as if she had. The son that uh, he kind of adopted would one day do the scandalous love. He would say, yes, you're all lost, but I'll become lost for you. You're all really sinners, and I'll become sinners for you. I mean, I don't know. Sometimes we get into these kind of funks where we think, you know, I'm just a loser. I just, what I've done, I can't turn back the clock on my life, you know. And Jesus says, I'll be that person no matter what you've done. No matter what it is in your life that you've done, you think that's so terrible. I'll be that, okay? You just take my grace, right? You, you, you just be, take my place. He says, I, I declare you now worthy because I become the scandal for you. And that's what happened on that Friday. You know, they said, you're a liar, Jesus. He hadn't lied. They said, you're a cheat, you're blasphemous. You're, you're pretending to be God. You're not really God, but he was, you see. And he became scandalous so that by him taking that on himself, we could be made righteous in him. Isn't this kind of his story? Even though it's about Joseph, isn't it really about Jesus? 2 Corinthians 5.21, Paul said it so well. He said, God caused the one who didn't know sin to be sin for our sake so that through him we could become the righteousness of God. Wow. There's the gospel in one verse. Made sin who didn't know sin to be sin for our sake so that through him we could become the righteousness of God. So the Christmas story points us to the truth that Salvation is always here, always available for us. And let's follow Joseph's example, break the rules of law to do what's right because Christmas reminds us of what's really right. I mean, we have the right to say whatever we want about other people. We have the right to ignore people. We have the right to trample on other people's reputation. We have the right to push ourselves up by pushing others down. We have that right. We can do that. But having the right doesn't make it right. And Joseph learned that following God all often means that we set aside what's the easiest, the most lucrative, the most gratifying for ourselves. And we listen to him. We accept the plan that he has for us. 
God does this for us, and as a result of the Christmas story, shows that, this, that salvation is here. Christmas reminds us of what's really right. So here, here's a question for you to take home today. I think it's a question of this, this passage. I mean, is, is God asking you to do something that you really don't want to do? He'll do that at times. God will ask you to do some things that you really don't want to do. It, it might make you look bad. It might make you put your feelings aside. It might make you, you know, cut somebody else some grace, as, as I say so often. What's he telling us this Christmas? Is he speaking? Let's sit in prayer for another minute with that. As deep cries out. 